this isn't some glorious savior, you know, solve your problems kind of surgery. Like there's weird aspects to it. I came to the conclusion my father caused my gender dysphoria. I have had like random sensations from what felt like my left testicle. I'm being like, where's that coming from? Because I know it's not there anymore. <laughs> so there have been some um, phantom limb type sensations. Well, I'm here today with Ari, who is a detransitioner, and we met on Twitter. And I'm so excited to be speaking with you today, Ari. Um, I'm looking forward to going through a bit about your journey with gender and hearing about your experiences and also hearing a little bit about more about who you are as a person and your interests and your career and all of that. So let's start with where you are right now, Ari. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing, what you are trying to achieve also with your communication on Twitter. You're someone who is giving advice and someone who can be a voice for other detransitioners what's your what are you up to right now let us know a little bit more about you yeah so to put it um as kind of crudely as possible i guess i'm in the middle of breaking out of my shell and i haven't really spoke publicly about a lot of my journey um and so right now on twitter i'm i'm really just kind of opening up for the first time in my life about a lot of things. And I want to be as open and honest as possible with my journey. There's, there's always people that can find something to relate to. And I don't know how many times in my life, if I had, you know, words of wisdom from the right person at the right time, you know, everything could have changed. And so I'm really just trying to um, open up and communicate there. And at the moment, what that looks like is I'm trying to start my own personal brand. I've been through a whole lot of learning this year. Uh, the pandemic really did a number on my mental health, and I found myself entrenched in old childhood, you know, maladaptive coping mechanisms and just unable to function. And I've had to dive in and, you know, face the discomfort and figure out what the hell is going on. And this year, when I, when I did dive into that, I figured out. I saw something in the early days of my gender dysphoria I hadn't seen before, and it changed kind of everything. And so, yeah, at the moment, I'm just trying to um, open up, give advice, trying to teach what I've learned, everything from um, trying to master flow state, fighting burnout, um, beating procrastination, learning how to do emotion regulation, um, trying to figure out um, good study practices, just, you know, good, uplifting, empowering things that any one, any, any person would want to know to lift themselves up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So what is it that you found that you kind of saw for the first time more recently? Yeah. So I just said a little, little bit of a backstory. I have up until May of this year, I had been on cross sex hormones for 18 years. I was a bit earlier in the transgender, I guess, wave back in the mid 2000s. So, you know, I had known about people. I've heard about people, but this wasn't common in any way. I was the first um, um, kid in high school to come out as trans to like a dean. And because, you know, because they're just like, what, what is this? You know, like before anyone had heard about a lot of this stuff. And Let's see. I the time that I'm referencing or that I that I was alluding to was a particular time when I visited my dad. So my dad wasn't really a part of my life. He left my mom and me when I was maybe one or two. Um and he moved to Idaho uh to get away in in his own words to get away from black people. Right. He wasn't a very good man. He was pretty, sometimes sadistic. He always acted like he had something to prove. Like he, he would, he would brag, up, you know, when I was like around 10 years old, he would brag about fighting strangers in Walmart. And so he moved away and every summer from like three to maybe 11, I went to visit him. And from the very beginning, all I remember, like, I don't even remember when there was a good time with him. 
there was it was as long as far back as I can remember, I remember just being traumatized and tormented by this man and and his girlfriend, which ended up becoming my stepmom. I just remembered hating I remember I I hated visiting them and talking to them because after, you know, the first day when it's like, oh, you know, my I get to see my son. Um, you know, like the, the quick honeymoon phase wears off and then he's right back to being an asshole. And um I remember this specific time Throughout my life, whenever I would, whenever someone's like, "How do you, how do you know that you were transgender? How do you know that, um, you know, like, how, like, where do these feelings come from?" And I remember always citing this very specific case when I was like six or seven, visiting my dad, and he had. I, I visited for three months because my mom was going through some mental health issues, and she shouldn't have done that. We've talked about it since, but I remember this just being like the worst three months of my life as a as a child. And when he would provoke me because I wasn't responding the way he wanted, one of my coping mechanisms would be to turtle. You know, I would just like dive down internally and I would just disassociate hardcore. And I didn't quite realize that that was what would happen, not really understanding some of the basic pillars of, you know, basic human mental health, the kinds of things and that humans need to survive like the kind of social connections and the kind of emotional intimacy that we need to really thrive I, di I didn't have any frame of reference much until this year and so up until this year when i would look back and something like how, how how did you know i would say that one specific time my father was provoking me and i just remember screaming out i wish i was a girl and since then that's when i knew and this year that entire situation has now been painted with a new light because I decided to stop running from my past. And I actually asked my mom, like, what do you remember about that time? What do you remember about him? Like, is there, like, clearly there's so many pieces to this puzzle that I'm missing my relationship with my father and how early childhood has went on to sculpt my current behaviors, habits, coping mechanisms, and things like that. She gave me two pieces of the puzzle that I had not had. One, he was a meth user, and he would constantly have meth withdrawals, and I'd had no idea. And that explains all of his like sporadic outbursts, where like one day, if I did a thing, it was perfectly fine, and then the next day, I do the same thing, and then boom, he just explodes on me. And I had no idea that that's what was happening because that, that explains his girlfriend's behavior and like so many crazy things that would happen. That explains why he would snap and provoke at me. And so with that piece of information, I realized that I really started to develop the coping mechanism of, you know, internalizing and disassociating. And the second piece of the puzzle was that my father always struggled with his own manhood. My mom said when I was three months old, like not even three years old, but three months old, when he couldn't get me under control, when I was crying, he would tell me to be a man. <laughs> like, wow. And I think maybe on some level, I blocked some of that out because looking back, I'm like, how could I forget? Like, that was one of his main things. It was just be a man, be a man. Are you a little girl? Like, be a man. And so whenever I wasn't responding the way he wanted, whenever he would, you know, provoke me and I would disassociate, one of the things he would provoke me with was, you know, be a man. And like, I wouldn't even cry because I would, I would disassociate so hard. He, he never really physically hit me except for on one occasion. And he hit me quite a lot. And he, he, he told, later told me that it was because I wouldn't cry. He was going to hit me until I cried and I didn't cry. And that's because I would disassociate. Wow. Was he trying yeah. to engage you? What was, why did he want you to cry? I think, yeah, I think he was trying to get me to engage. Like he, he, he was trying to get me to interact and, you know, his coping mechanisms of getting someone to interact, it just didn't work on me because I don't think he was ever in a situation where someone was just forced to disassociate like 
in front of him. And I was a child, so I, I couldn't go anywhere. And so I think he was his way of trying to get me to communicate. Um, but like, clearly it didn't, it didn't work. I, I remember them, they even took me, like my stepmom took me to go get my hearing checked because she was like, maybe, maybe I can't hear, but it, it was the disassociation. And so, okay, yeah, so, that specific way uh -huh. of provoking me, I would, when I would disassociate, I would just think to myself, I hate being a boy. I, I don't want to be a boy. If I was a girl, maybe he wouldn't treat me like this. Maybe he wouldn't provoke me and torment me if I was a girl. And, and, and I think that just continued for like a month or two. And then it was shortly after that, I stopped visiting him. I, I, after talking with my mom, she's like, you don't have to go visit. I remember I finally got enough courage to say, like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another interesting thing was for a few years, things were a bit okay. But my mom was also dealing with her own mental health issues. Um, there was a lot of neglect as well. Um, but some years later, when depression started to set in, in my early teenage years, that's when the gender dysphoria came back with a vengeance. Like it hit me like a ton of bricks. And, you know, I think what was happening was I fell into back, you know, I can't handle what's happening around me. I fall back into this, you know, coping mechanism. And I wish I was a girl came back. And it came back and it was so vivid that I just got consumed by it. I'm like, I must be transgender. And were you still in touch with your dad at that point? Um, so I kind of stopped talking to him, but he would call every year, maybe twice a year to kind of check in. And I was already not interested in having much of a relationship because of the way he would constantly treat me and talk to me. And maybe when I was like 13 or 14 was when um, the gender dysphoria came back hard. I was convinced that I was trans and that I had to transition. I told he called and I told him then. And he wasn't pleased. Like he, his his initial response to me telling him that was, does that mean you're going to learn how to do laundry? Ooh. <laughs> so like, wow. He had a lot of his own issues, but there was no way that he was going to be cool with that, you know, with me being trans. And, you know, some years after that, I think he finally, like, I think he divorced his wife, um, the, the girlfriend I was talking about. And he, I think he finally got off drugs, perhaps, and tried to make more of an effort to turn things around. But when I was 19, so maybe like five years after that phone call, he passed away. He had cancer and the chemo, I think, did it. But our relationship was so bad at that point that all I felt was relief. Like, he can't hurt me anymore. And, you know, like, Looking back in retrospect, there are these things that happened where I'm like, well, that's a huge red flag, you know? Like, I was so convinced that I was just over him. Like, it was my past, you know, it doesn't really matter. I don't, I don't spend any time thinking about him, really. I'm just over it, right? And I wasn't. I somehow defined my entire life around what he did to me, you know? This insecure insecure with with under with like you know being a guy and the trauma that he caused me i just it's like his trauma was white space and i just wrapped myself around it entirely convincing myself that it didn't affect me you know life has a weird way of revealing itself like oh turns out the way you thought this whole thing was this entire time nope <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. And were you ever able to tell your mom about the physical abuse that, you know, that your dad did? 
Were you ever, were you ever able to talk about that? Yeah, whenever I would come back from visiting him, my like from my mom's perspective, like I always just felt different for days. Like I came back just like either immediately in tears or disconnected. But she knew every time I would go and visit, like it would just be a terrible experience. And I think that three month trip she sent me she sent me there so she could kind of disconnect herself with her because of her own mental health issues. She still regrets that to this day. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that, definitely. Um I wanted to ask you when you did start to think of yourself as transgender, you said you were about thirteen or fourteen. What did that feel like? What did that what did the gender dysphoria feel like to you at that time? Yeah. That's a good question. I think the biggest feeling was really just like an inc- incongruence with my body. I like it, it got it got to a point where my physical body was like repel it was like kind of like I felt repulsed by my my physical body I felt consumed and disgusted by like um, like male sexual urges I when it was really bad I wouldn't even want to masturbate cuz I didn't want to touch myself and you know, being a teenager, like that's a part of growing up. And I remember just, you know, I I I want to be a part of that group, not this group. It, it was kind of like a, a bunch of different things, like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can definitely understand that. Um, did you feel like there was maybe some sense of safety in the the group of the girls as you perceived it? Yeah. Yeah, there was because my my mom and my grandma raised me. My mom was still pretty emotionally immature at the time. She was 24. And so my grandma was really kind of raising both of us. And there was kind of an event that really made my family kind of go downhill. I'll um me back up really quick. So my main family, because my dad was gone, what I knew is my core family was my grandma, my mom, my mom's brother, so my uncle, and I had maybe one family of cousins in the same city. Uh, so Christmas was always just me, my mom, my grandma, and my uncle. There was one other uncle my mom's oldest brother and uh, my my grandma dealt with a lot of abuse when she was younger and had them and she had to get the kids away from her husband but the husband was incredibly manipulative from my understanding i mean i was young when it when all this went down um and it was possibly involved with selling uh drugs and whatever happened a situation got my uncle killed and it was like immediately in his own father's like vicinity like it was because of some situation that happened whatever that situation might have actually been and i think his death destroyed my grandma my uncle and my mom and their 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 mental health just tanked after that and how old and were you when he died one or two okay so very young yeah very formative years yeah Mm -hmm. so i didn't remember him i just remember a specific picture okay and um my uncle turned my my uncle that was still alive turned to alcohol my mom dealt with a lot of mental health stuff i think my grandma just you know losing a child like she was pretty burnt you know and so th- my immediate family was just a small group of people and it was mostly just my mom and my grandma and so i always had them and growing up 
there would be some safety spending time with the girls. Something about my father, like I th something about the way he would interact with me made me just scared of men in general. Because I remember I had a friend who was a boy and we were both like eight or nine and his dad took us fishing and we were trying to go fishing and I moved my rod in a way that I think made him, made the, made the dad think that I had caught something. And so I look over and just the particular way that he, his eyes caught attention and he walked towards me. It's like, I just immediately went into this like triggered trauma response. It reminded me of my father. And I just like locked up. And so I think that in a lot of ways projected itself onto other men. And that was part of, you know, this whole soup of ingredients that led to my transition. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you had a lot of different traumas, it sounds like, going on and a lot of and this sort of complexity behind them, right? There was different layers of different elements. There was your dad who was abusive to you and then also had his own addiction issues and drugs and um and then over on your mom's side sounds like there was also a lot of trauma for everyone involved over there um yeah. and it it sounds like that was extremely formative for you especially in that very young age you know they were we know how much trauma can affect that child for the rest of their lives potentially you know from that age especially with such severe things going on um and then when you were a teenager and you started to have that extreme discomfort in your body you didn't even want to touch yourself and those you know awful feelings what was it that so so you said that you conceived of yourself as transgender what was it that made you think you know that word transgender or that concept where did you hear about transgender yeah so this is really interesting because from from my memory I remember feeling that I wanted to be a girl before I even knew, I even heard the term transgender. And I think, you know, I had felt like that off and on for a few years. And it was possibly like a TV show that was talking about transsexuals and some of the procedures and stuff like that. And I remember my friend being like, that's what you want to do. Me being like, like that, or maybe like that's a way to do it or... You know, I, I, I saw something out there and that's when it went from, I feel this way to, can I do something about this? And I must have found more about it online, but I can't really remember the details beyond that. Okay. Okay. So it was something on a TV show and it kind of fit or it seemed like it fit what you had already been feeling, the discomfort and the desire to change or to become a girl and then who, who did you talk about it to so it sounds like your friend that you were with did you talk did you tell your mom or you know who else did you talk about it to yeah so i forget exactly the timeline of me coming out i think i hit a really bad mental place when i was like 14 I told my best friend at the time who, you know, wasn't really comfortable with a lot of LGBT stuff, but he came around pretty quickly. And then, yeah, I think, I think I maybe felt that way for a year, year and a half before I started really coming out. And I have a half sister. I have a few half siblings from my father. And my half sister lived in the same town, and I didn't even know about her. And we found we found out about her through someone at a school, or we found out about each other through someone at a school, and we quickly became friends. And so I came out to her, and I, you know, social media was really starting, you know, mid two thousands, early two thousands. So we're talking like MySpace, <laughs> and I had a lot of friends on MySpace, people with all kinds of styles. You know, MySpace was really this place where you can customize your profile like a bedroom, whether you were goth, scene kid, country, you know, maybe someone had all the re like the religious stuff in quotes up on their profile. And so you can find all of these sub 
cultures, among subcultures. And I found a handful of other people who experienced gender dysphoria and we were, we, we all thought we were, we were trans. And so, you know, we just, it's kind of like a little support network, at least, you know, from that, from that perspective at that time, you know, and it's important for people to find groups and, and comfort like that. But you know, at the same time, we can all accidentally steer each other in directions that might not be so healthy. But I mean, on, online, even in the mid 2000s was a place for people to come together for this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you got more involved with online communities, sounds like, in your teens. Yeah. Um, and was that, um, would you say that that introduced you in- to more transgender concepts? Yeah, yeah, that, it definitely introduced me to, it made it more normal and visible. This was, this was at a time before, um, identities like non-binary this was before when 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 saying i'm transgender meant i'm going to transition to the opposite sex right what we would now call transsexuals that's what that meant then so it was it was still kind of like i guess focused to that's what people meant in those communities okay did that answer your question yes absolutely so Yeah, that's definitely a big demarcation, right? Because now people can declare themselves trans and you really don't know exactly what that means. It could mean a pronoun change. It could mean not even a pronoun change. It could mean a whole spectrum of things. So, um, so, and do you mind me asking how old are you? I'm 34. Okay. Okay. Got you. Yeah. So millennial like myself. Um, Mm -hmm. so we're not part of the, you know, Gen Z cohort. They've got a slightly different iteration of what's going on, but many of the same things as well. So when you were getting more into those, into those online communities and the transgender identity, if that's, you know, correct me, if that's not how you would describe it, but what was the first step that you took toward making this, you know, bringing this into your real life? Yeah. So I guess there, you know, some social transition. This was during, so I, uh, freshman year, I was coming out to friend groups, but I was still very, um, sensitive to getting, you know, bullied or essentially I just wanted to fly under the radar, not really draw any attention to myself and just trying to fit in and i would have loved to fit in as the opposite sex but at that time i mean you know it's not like now where someone's like oh did you say something homophobic and pull out their phone you know like back then people would just call each other names and stuff all the time and so like i started wearing tighter pants and so people would make fun of me for wearing tight pants (laughs) i started to grow out my hair i wasn't really out to any teachers um, this kind of, um, I can kind of go into a bit more depth about this freshman year because this was like a pivotal time for my transition Just out to friends. They were mostly using my preferred pronouns, which were she, her at the time. And, um, as friends would come in, people would like, let them know, like my deal and stuff like that. The first half of that year, I going into the boys locker room gave me severe gender dysphoria i really just didn't i was like i'm happy to participate in pe i just don't want to go into the guys locker room you know because i'm (laughs) mentally suffering (laughs) and i ended up just just, i stopped changing for pe and my pe teacher would just write me up you know like detention every day and after like a week, he was like, what's going on? And, you know, like this stuff isn't easy to talk about. And so, you know, just being upset and my, co- my, you know, my coping mechanism, I just, you know, I don't know, it's hard for me to open up. And he didn't really make much of an effort after that point. And so I just got detentions every day, which led to, which led to Saturday schools. And I, the only activity that really brought me any kind of joy with skateboarding at the time it was so independent and i just would just feel it out i spent many years skateboarding and i got pretty okay at it you know i wasn't 
I wasn't terrible for the time and for the skill level of the people in my city. And so I'm just like, like whatever. Like I, I plan to, I, I would like to make this a profession. You know, I, I get my own physical exercise, like who cares? And, and this like, you know, detentions. And I, I never did really well in school. In, el in, in elementary school, there are many years where I just did absolutely terribly. I was held back in third grade. In high school was just different because you don't have, like, like, the connections with these teachers aren't as personal, or at least it didn't seem like that from my perspective. And that's when the gender dysphoria got really bad. So there was all these detentions, and there was doing terribly in my classes. And it, it just felt like, like, this is a lost cause. And so I was like, let me try to salvage this. And like, I went to try and tell my dean, you know, I'm transgender. Here's what that means. And it was really funny. I'm like, I'm like, I think from my, from the way I remember it, I worded it something like, I'm transgender. That means, you know, maybe I want to transition sexes or maybe I'm really a girl on the inside. I, I plan to do this change. I, I don't want to change in the guy's locker room. And the very first thing out of his mouth was, well, you can't use the women's locker room. And it was really interesting because I was dumbfounded that he even suggested that as something that I would potentially want, which is interesting because, you know, with the stuff we hear in the media nowadays, that's what people want. But at that time for me, I didn't want to go into the women's locker room. I would have stuck out like a sore thumb. Like, you know, that would have, that would have made my gender dysphoria even worse. I wanted as little attention as possible. I'm like, no, 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 no. Is there any single person bathroom that I can just go in and change and that's it? Um, and this was really old school, so they, they really didn't have that option either. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I put in some effort and the school, you know, like what they should have been like, we're going to get you some therapy. But they kind of just, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come back to ask for anything else and they just kind of let it go. And so I just spent the whole rest of the year just not changing. And by the time sophomore year hit, it was so bad. I dropped out within my first few weeks of sophomore year. When you dropped out, what did you do next? Yeah. So when I dropped out, I went into like a homeschooling program because that was a way to, you know, legally stop going to school and that didn't last very long either and then it was just uh essentially no school and i just kept skateboarding hoping that that would eventually bring me a profession um and i like if i had like if if i had the tools and mechanisms to evaluate my performance Maybe I could have done something with that sport, but once I hit a plateau in skill level, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't progressing, and then my mental health tanked again, <laughs> and yeah. that was like my only outlet I had for years, and, and then it was just, you know, what the hell do I do from here, mm -hmm. and I got obsessed with... um massive multiplayer online role-playing game because <laughs> you know who doesn't have that phase in their life and you know that was an interesting experience getting to play out you know i get to, i get to make my character female and live as female in the game maybe this is some kind of like refuge for me and um the game was also notoriously difficult so you you almost always had to communicate and make friends with and group up with people to do basic things so there was a lot of you know camaraderie and community building and i got to just be my character and that definitely um it wasn't much longer after that that i was able to start transitioning with hormones and i think i was like 15 or 16 when i started okay and how did you get your hands on the hormones yeah so I found out about, I, I forget exactly what, if it was a, like a program or something, but I found a therapist 
I think we tried to see a therapist once and they were like, I don't know anything about this gender stuff. And then I found a therapist that herself was transsexual and I think she helped specifically help people with um, gender dysphoria. And so I went to go see her over the course of maybe like six months. This was back when there were some decent safeguards in place where there was therapy over multiple sessions to try and figure out what's going on. And we had to commute to it, to, I think, Berkeley, perhaps. And and that was a good, you know, 50, 60 mile drive. And I don't remember what we talked about. It was literally so long ago. And maybe we touched on my childhood. But they weren't able to figure out, you know, what aspects led to where I'm at. And so they gave me the green light, went to San Francisco and got a prescription for testosterone blockers uh, and, and estrogen. And then my grandma hit some financial trouble and I stopped doing it through the doctor and found out that you can order a lot of this shit online. And so I just self-medicated. And, and how old were you when you first started with the blockers and the estrogen? So I must have been 15 or 16. And it wasn't, a, from my understanding, I'm not exactly sure. So I know that like Lupron is a puberty blocker. And then there's spirolactone, which is a testosterone suppressant. So I was okay. on the testosterone suppressant and on estrogen, 15 or 16. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so you were on that, and then you switched to ordering it online. And yeah. how long How long was that going on? Yeah, so that was going on until I left my hometown. Uh, so from like 16 to 18 and a half, maybe 19. I was either on some combinations of testosterone blockers and estrogen or just the testosterone blockers. And by the time I was, you know, starting to look for a job at like 17, 18, financial crisis. And so it was hard to find jobs at pizza places, you know? And I was just so desperate to get out of my hometown because I'm like, you know, all my friends, you know, can either get a job or their parents will buy them a car and then that opens up opportunity and my grandma can't afford any of this stuff and my mom is essentially full mental breakdown at this point doesn't live with us anymore and you know when i came out to her my mom she didn't accept it very well at first and then you know i i did a lot of the you know emotional blackmail manipulation tactics i'm not going to talk to you anymore uh, would rather have a living daughter or a dead son, you know, shit like that. And that hurt our relationship. And it was self-medicating. I wanted to get out of my suburb, my hometown. I was willing to go almost anywhere. And I moved in with my ex who lived in a suburb of LA. So that was a huge change. That opened up more opportunity. I was a kid, you know, desperate for attention, desperate for affection. I had a long history of, you know, dating someone until things fall apart and then I run away. Um, I've bailed on, I don't know how many friend groups. I've been a terrible friend. I've been a terrible partner. And uh, I, f I fucked up our relationship. Sorry if I'm not allowed to cuss. That's but okay. I, no, yeah. say whatever you want. After I moved in, I messed up our relationship pretty quickly. I still owe a hefty apology for that. And I was just like, I don't have any other option. I cannot go back home. I would literally rather be homeless. And so I found a youth homeless shelter program in Hollywood. And they had some bunk beds for, you know, um, young adults. LGBT people. And so there's kind of, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it is now, or but at least in the mid late 2000s and early 2010s, a lot of cities have these youth homeless shelter programs. 
And when I say youth, I mean between 18 and 24 years old. Um, I don't know how below 18 works in those situations. But, you know, for kids who run away and are legal adults like this, you know, places like this exist. And so I, it was terrifying <laughs> being homeless in a shelter, you know, even though it was probably nowhere near as bad as, you know, regular adult shelters, but still it was, it was really scary. And they told me to just go back home to my grandma. But I was so adamant. I'm like, I do not see a future there. And I ended up staying at this other holy youth homeless shelter called the Covenant House. And I think it was a religiously sponsored endeavor, but they were incredibly progressive. And so I ended up staying there for a good six to nine months. Mm. And yeah, go mm. ahead. Um, can I ask, were your partners generally male, female? Who were you attracted to? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And some people might find this surprising. Mostly female. I've dated, I've, I've dated guys, and I, I am bi. Okay. I, uh, and looking back now, I think it was just, you know, I was just so comfortable with women and so uncomfortable with men. I didn't even want to be in that category. but. Yeah, mostly women that I've been with. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, and then when so you're living in this youth hostel in the or in this shelter, this youth shelter in in LA, and that must have been you know full of many more formative and crazy experiences. I'm sure. Um, at that point what was your what was your next step with transition were and were you going by she her did people generally respect that what was the what was the the feeling at that time in your life with the transition yeah so by that time maybe around 16 or 17 i was already socially transitioned even if i still looked pretty male you know taking hormones but you know guys friends this is how i feel you know this is who i am and so a lot of my friends would comply and, you know, they want to be supportive. People are empathic. You know, they want to make you, you feel better, even, you know, even if it's in the long run, not to your best interest. And so friends in my hometown, when I moved in with my ex, uh, I moved in under the pretenses that I was female and they didn't know. They just thought I was incredibly androgynous. And... And so, yeah, from th that point on, I became homeless and I just, you know, fully identified as, you know, um, you know, I'm trans, she, her, you know. Did you become homeless? You, you because... don't normally say female oh. pronouns. But... I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Was it, did it not work out with that person because of the discrepancy there where they thought you were female? No, it didn't work out because I was a terrible partner and wanted to introduce um, an open relationship in an incredibly okay. unhealthy way. So okay. I think I was... I want to say I felt like I was pretty narcissistic when I was younger, although I don't have the ability to diagnose myself or, you know, I hope I'm not narcissistic now. And, but I was incredibly self-absorbed, self-centered, and it was a big, pretty big lack of regard for people's feelings. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, I was kind of just this wrecking ball that moved through people's lives, and I would detach when it got too painful for me. So it wasn't, okay. you know, I had a lot of unhealthy relationships. And it takes a lot of self-awareness to you know, say that. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, maybe looking back at that young stage of, you know, brand new adulthood, that might be something that, you know, a lot of people kind of experience and whether or not, you know, they're self-aware about it later is a different story too. So, okay. So all this stuff was happening and then you ended up homeless and then 
you, while homeless, were you still able to access the hormones that you were taking? Were you still taking those? Yeah, so that's a good question. Once I was kind of settled at the shelter, then I was able to go see a clinic. And up to that point, even up until the clinic, I was still buying medication from online. And so this was like, oh, there's actually a clinic here. Okay, cool. You could even get on like insurance and stuff. And so there was this clinic not too far from the shelter in West Hollywood. And it was where all the transgender people went to get, you know, therapy and hormones and stuff. I didn't have a lot of my records and information from the previous doctor. So we started from scratch. And I could already tell, like, it, it only, it'd only been a few years, but I could already tell the process for going through this is, has already widened significantly. I think I had two, three therapy sessions over the course of not even a month, and then a psychiatrist, and then hormones. And there wasn't a lot of pushback, you know, like, they're compassionate, they want to, they want to help them. Maybe empathetic is a better way of saying it. I think compassion means having to do what's right even if it makes someone feel uncomfortable but you know being empathetic can often mean prioritizing someone's short-term feelings over long-term well-being and so i think they were being empathic because they were good people they wanted to help and that's when i got on like i got finally back on a stable uh, amount of hormones to transition kind of for the long haul because it was a little bit rocky up until that point. And, and yeah, I saw, I saw that I, I went to that clinic and used their services up until I left Hollywood. Okay. And then what, what was the, what was your next step in transitioning? Where did you take it after hormones? Yeah. So, I decided to leave Hollywood and I went to San Francisco because now I knew that there were these homeless shelters. I, and so I, I figured I figured out their program there and I I got myself a bed and then um quickly accessed the the same kind of services in San Francisco. They had a little clinic in the Castro and um, it was also incredibly easy there as well. You know, like I don't even maybe one or two things of therapy and hormones. Maybe it wasn't even that hard. Like it was just easy peasy. And from the shelter, I got into a transitional living program, which is, um, you get, you kind of, you know, here's an apartment, a room in an apartment, no rent, but you have to save and for two, and you get it for two years. And that way, it's like the step from the shelter to eventually taking care of yourself. One interesting thing that I want to highlight, though, is that from the shelter in Hollywood and the shelter in San Francisco, a large percentage of the homeless youth were LGBT or trans and seeking transition. Like the percentages that are just way higher than your average. and you know, I'm sure some of that is, you know, I mean, maybe people getting kicked out or disowned for being gay, but there are also a lot of instances where uh, this thing called transition exists, and I've I've seen countless times, like I've went into a friend group and exited a friend group, leaving gender dysphoria in my wake like confusing people not me like hey maybe you're trans you know i'm sure there have been instances of me doing that but just being trans around other people gives people the idea that hey something's not right with me maybe i'm trans and i've seen people go through this part of the transition without the same level of conviction that i had you know like i had to deal with obstacles in the beginning, it got easier, but I had a lot of conviction for this path, and I've seen other people 
way with way less resolve just you know come on in and was that more teens ad- uh, or adults would you say um between the ages of 18 and 24 i don't know what below 18 looked like cuz my cohort of peers were really between 18 and 24 okay so young adult basically was that that era yeah yeah okay interesting all right so it was getting basically it sounds like increasingly easier to get access to these hormones and what kind of changes were you experiencing in your body yeah so um growing breast tissue um it never got really big but I definitely grew some breast tissue and you know when I wear like a a shirt you can still see they, they really aren't that large at all so I I kind of consider myself lucky now other people um have a lot more tissue growth than that not to mention you know cosmetic surgeries that people can get um I noticed a huge dip in sex drive um, I don't think I was completely done with puberty at 15 because how can I say? Um, I guess yeah, I guess just through, you know, personal experience my body like my body wasn't fully developed and so the hormones kind of stunted it and you know male genitalia is not made for estrogen so you know <laughs> mm-hmm. it's nothing nothing like super serious just um you know it's not going to grow anymore did you end up getting any surgeries while you were in that period of your life yeah, yeah, I did. When I was 24, I got bottom surgery. It was just full tunnel vision. You know, like I'm trans, I'm going to transition and then I'm going to I'm going to get bottom surgery. But there were two main kinds of bottom surgery then. There's the kind where they just invert the penis and they just work with that. And then there's another one where they actually use part of your colon to formulate the inside of the vaginal cavity and that one you know you can actually have a mucous membrane on the inside and i'm like well that seems more realistic to me and you know being so tunnel visioned like am i even picturing what that's going to look like to open me up and to take out like parts of my body to reconstruct this thing you know what kind of results what what, what can i expect this to you know living with it what's that going to be like afterwards like there wasn't a lot of that on my mind (laughs) and did they talk to you about it did the surgeons or the doctors talk to you about what that would look like so i remember asking a doctor at my clinic about those kinds of surgeries but i don't think they had really spent a lot of time with people post-op you know for a lot of these you know kids it was really just You know, maybe a lot of them won't get that far. For a lot of trans guys, it was, you know, top surgery. That was the main thing. And that was cheaper. And so, like, I think I just, you know, I think they didn't have enough information. And the psychiatrist, I did, I did have to get a letter signed off by a psychiatrist. And I saw a therapist, like that was, you know, I saw a therapist for maybe like four, five, six, seven, eight times, and then a psychiatrist for the surgery. So there was still some safeguarding a little bit for surgery, but they still didn't help me dig in to figure out what was going on. And then the only place that would do the surgery that I wanted was in Thailand at the time. And it was an institute called the PIA Institute, I think it's called. And so I emailed them and I was like, I want the surgery. And they're like, okay let's make this happen. And I booked a plane ticket and booked the surgery. And my grandma was planning on coming with me. 
she was always very supportive. She was the first family member I came out to and immediately was accepting. And um, she was a, kind of a hermit. She really didn't like to leave her comfort zone. <laughs> and so when the time came and she realized that she was going to have to be on a plane for like 13 hours and then spend three weeks in Thailand with me, she backed out. <laughs> and so I just went to Thailand on my own. I'm like, I was, I was just, I was like, you, you know, like those ridiculous anime characters that are so resolved, like, I, I will die for this, you know, just, I was so tunnel visioned. And, and you were about 24? Sorry, just to yeah, clarify. Yeah, 24. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I went to Thailand and I, you know, brought some money orders with me. And I remember talking to the doctor and they're like, are you sure you want this surgery? And I'm like, yes. They're like, okay, it's going to take an extra day of prep. And I'm like, it's okay. I came here for this specific one. And I remember there being a whole bunch of stuff for me to sign and not a lot of interest in helping me really understand what I was getting into. You know, and for a lot of people, maybe it's like, how could you let a foreign country carve into you not having an idea of what this was going to be like? And, you know, for idealistic kids we, we do we do you know I, I was still so emotionally immature at 24 i still find myself emotionally immature in a lot of ways now i was just not mature enough to make these decisions i just had no idea what i was in for and i didn't have any like parental support you know like my mom didn't she was always so busy dealing with her own stuff she never cared how i did in school that's why i didn't do so well you know like, i didn't i didn't have a positive male role model and so i was just i was looking up to you know, these heroes in fiction who just fight to the tooth and nail for what they believe is right. And that's just what I was doing. And I, they, they, I signed all the papers and then they gave me this crazy laxative because my whole system had to be cleaned out to be able to, to use it. And that was the craziest, roughest night I remembered in a long time, just draining myself of like all liquid essentially couldn't even drink water because um you know they're they're messing with parts of the body with like the urethra and stuff and they did you know and i went in for the surgery and no hesitation even on the operating table like i'm like there's a non-zero chance i'm gonna die and i'm okay with that <laughs> and the you know the surgeon's like okay your name and like, all right, cool. We're just gonna chop, chop, and then we're gonna be in the thing. And they made me laugh. And um, the next thing I know, I'm waking up, and like surgery is all done, and I'm just like, you know, finally, like some relief. And you know, I was on morphine for like a like a week in the hospital, watching my favorite shows, just relaxing. And they have me on an IV. It's like I didn't have to move. And then the first time that I got any kind of a glimpse as to my new anatomy was, you know, because I'm just like bandaged and just chilling. He was like, you know, the catheter is in. I don't have to move anything. And the doctor comes in and, he, and he's going to take out the gauze from the inside of the cavity. And the gauze is, you know, inside the mucous membrane, inside the neovagina. And he pulls out the gauze. And I just remember this like dull pain take over my body almost where you're just kind of like you can't move and you're just like oh, is it over and it, and it was so uncomfortable and so like i knew i had i knew about dilation um and after you know a few days after the they took out the gauze is when i you know i start using the restroom on my own again get up and walk and then after that it was essentially two straight weeks of recovering on my own in the hotel and it was it was very lonely <laughs> didn't have a lot of good food and my body is just healing and i'm trying to let me tell you dilating on an open wound not fun not not fun it was just incredibly uncomfortable and I, I just like you know like if i can get through this like it'll be better you know. And what about when you saw it for the first time? Were you, what was your emotional reaction? 
I felt good and relieved. Like I felt like like it, it was it was the thing I had been I had my eye on for like ten years, you know? It was the my sole purpose kind of at that point. And so I just felt, you know, like immense good honeymoon feelings, you know, just like, oh my god, it's finally happened. I can finally be myself as if this anatomy change is just gonna heal everything in here, right? But I didn't have any kind of idea what you know, what was happening mentally with a lot of this. And so it was just like like great, you know, like ta da Finally I can be I can be happy. <laughs> And I get back home, and I just carry back on as normal with like work, and I just I just felt better for a long time. And after it healed for the most part, and I was still dilating, I had realized that like sex is not going to be some easy natural thing you know essentially like it doesn't stretch or flex you know like a real vagina it, it you have like the outside is skin like regular you know skin and then the inside is mucous membrane and they're attached and they're two entirely different elasticities and so it's like taking a really flexible fabric and then a, a inflexible fabric and if you stitch them together and you try to pull, you're just going to see the seams start to pull and tear. And so essentially it doesn't it doesn't flex. Like you have to slowly dilate up over time. And it can be painful. And so essentially anyone like if I wanted to date a guy and I wanted to like try to have sex like a woman, then their size was a was like the determining factor. And and it would essentially just have to be really small, or I would have to do a ton of work over time to get anywhere near a point like that. And I maybe like a year after that no let me see within a year of surgery and healing i dated someone um a guy and we were together for a bit over a year and i think we had sex maybe a few times only because um it's just incredibly uncomfortable to dilate and it's not it's not a fun process <laughs> yeah. So, yeah yeah it doesn't even work <laughs> So so you felt like it didn't work? Was that something that you acknowledged at the time? Or how did you think of it? Did you think like this will work? Maybe I could get I could figure this out. Did you feel any any sense of disappointment with it? Or did you have hope that it could work? I I think I felt disappointed with you know, it's it's functionality and usability. And Sorry, can you repeat your question, please? Yeah. Um, did you did you have any sense of like, oh, we can work this out. I can figure this out. Maybe I need to dilate more. Maybe I need to, you know, just relax more. Maybe I can find a way to make it work. Or did you think like, oh, this there's something maybe wrong with the surgery itself? Mm, I see. Yeah. So I didn't. You know, I was lucky. No complications. I knew that it wasn't a surgery thing. I knew that your uh, the initial width or you know diameter of the cavity they can create um, is tied into um, the diameter of the penis they have to work with, right? And so you know, having kind of stopped a lot of my at least you know having fully gone through puberty. They didn't have like a ton to work with. I know mean, that's a huge problem now with um, male to female identified trans people, especially go through puberty blockers. They just don't have enough to work with. 
And I knew that it was a limitation of biology and science. So I've always I've always been kind of scientifically oriented. I wouldn't say I've been the best at research, but I could tell I'm like this this is what they can do right now. And so, you know, disappointment, some some disappointment. But after me and that guy broke up, I very quickly stopped caring about my perceived gender. I quickly stopped caring about how I identified. I I wasn't regretting my surgery because I still had dysphoria with my body, but I was also for the first time I wasn't so beholden to passing as the opposite sex as wanting to live as the opposite sex. Like that was my goal for so long. And I think what happened is, you know, I spent a lot of years trying to pass and after surgery, I got to date a guy and just, you know, kind of get as close as a man can get to living as a woman in what resembled like kind of a heterosexual relationship. And it wasn't anywhere near what it was cracked up to be. <laughs> okay. Um, I found I was always pretty weird and didn't really fit into a lot of um you know certain groups or or stereotypes a lot of gender dysphoria and wanting to transition and ideas of being a man and a woman seem to be tied in with a lot of this regressive stereotype way of thinking i think i even stopped taking hormones for a year after that but that was after surgery right so i'm not producing any hormones mm -hmm. and i just let myself get really androgynous and i think i just kind of fell into a depression and I was kind of just getting by and, you know, when you don't have hormones in your body, like it can fuck with your bone density. Um, it messes with your mood, hot flashes. Oh my goodness. They're not fun. And that's when I, f I, f I first really let go of how I was being perceived so much, but that was before I even moved to Seattle and years before I ended up detransitioning. And at this point, I had been off hormones for at least a year, maybe a year and a half. And I had no, you know, like I was dealing with all the hot flashes and stuff. And then I'm like, maybe I just need to get back on hormones. Maybe that's what the problem is. And so I go to the clinic that I've been seeing up until now. And I, once again, don't think I gave them any of my records from the clinic in San Francisco where I had been going. And this time, you know, all any, all safeguards are off. You're just like, cool. You come here for hormones. Here's your prescription. There's just there's just no no question. Like I I feel like I went through more of a uh, it was even more difficult getting um, Adderall for ADHD. <laughs> and so I got back on estrogen because getting back on testosterone and living as a guy explicitly was still not on my radar but i had also you know been like i don't really care people don't perceive me as female i'm just like i'm my own thing like that's just kind of just felt androgynous looked androgynous um i still prefer she her pronouns but i i even at that point i stopped caring about pronouns you know the, the interesting part is i hadn't really i still hadn't really encountered the core of gender ideology even up to this point I, heard about non-binary and to me that always meant like eh, you know like being like transitioning sex is one thing kind of labeling how you feel is another i don't really try to live as a woman I don't, but i'm also not living as a guy non-binary feels like that makes sense to me and so for me that was just like i don't really fit either um role or stereotype and i had friends who identified as non-binary before that and it took me a long time to go from still using female pronouns to non-binary but i felt like it was a step in the right direction um that ended up leading to some complications 
I believe in retrospect to the job that I got afterwards. In the beginning of 2022, I got a tech job and I worked there from January to December 2022. And I came out as non-binary to them. It's like, hey, letting you guys know, identify as non-binary. I prefer the name pronouns. But I'm also not about to be one of these people who are going to make a big fuss. So I was like, they're just preferred. Don't worry too much about it, you know, trying to be understanding. But I had not realized, you know, to the extent things like DEI departments had really gotten a, a hold of companies and institutions. And I think I, from day one, essentially put this barrier between me and my coworkers and made it harder for them to talk to me, harder for them to reach out, harder for them. Like they, I think they were probably just walking on eggshells all the time. And my project manager, she was great. I loved talking with her. And I could tell that she saw something happening like this because she would love she would always ask me questions and she would love for me to just talk about my experience, kind of like how I'm doing now. But she, she was, I, I could tell she was really curious. Like you say you're identifying as non-binary and you're trans, but you're not acting like a lot of the stuff that we're seeing online because she, she said something like, yeah, I've been reading this book. It's really great. I love JK Rowling. She is a fantastic author. Author. Right. And like saying something like that would make one of my friends be like, eh, what did you say? Why would you like her books? You know? And I'm just like, yeah, her books are great. You know, back, back in 2020, when people freaked out about what JK Rowling said, I was just like, what the fuck's happening? Like, man, it must've been bad. And I read her tweet and then I read her blog, read her post. And I'm like, what the hell is everybody talking about? And I try to have these conversations with people, and I've even had friends who aren't trans emotionally derail conversations with me about J.K. Rowling, and I'm just like, "What the hell's going on?" <laughs> They're trying to um, tell you, <laughs> who've had this experience with being transgender. They're trying to tell you, "Oh, you should be offended by this," or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, like, shh, let me be offended on your behalf. <laughs> you know, it's like right, you know, and and. Yeah, that was, you know, I lost that job and it was a bit of a wake up call. I was struggling with being productive and, you know, getting into flow state, fighting procrastination, defeating burnout, understanding how my own mind was working. What are my weaknesses? What am I struggling with? I just didn't have the answers to these questions. I didn't have the perspective. I was like way too stimulated on Adderall. My prescription was way too high. And I began self-medicating with smoking weed. And I eventually, you know, not having had a job for months, trying desperately to build my own things, you know, trying to like build up my skills or build myself something, invest in myself, you know, and not, ha and like having had, like throughout the entire pandemic, my attempts at conversations with the friend that I live with have just broken down broken down and broken down and you know like i tried really hard to be understanding and like i even started learning about this thing called street epistemology back in like 2019 which is a really good way of communicating with people across political divides it's about like learning and listening and understanding and working together as a team instead of being in an adversarial kind of way, exploring the truth together to help people, you know, develop their own internal reasons for things instead of just, you know, we tell people that they're wrong. It doesn't work. They get defensive. When they're defensive, you, you should stop having the conversation because it's, you know, me and my friend, like I, I tried really hard to be understanding, but I had, I've seriously lacked communication skills ever since I was a child. And, and then did you have any regret about the physical aspect of transition? Yeah. So when I, I really started to de like it all, it all at the beginning of the year, I'll just kind of wrap up 
this year and the D transition, and then go into some of the regrets that I have now with my new perspective. Um, in addition to struggling with getting me to work with myself, I started diving back into a lot of the cultural changes that have been happening. I read um, How Minds Change from David McRaney, and that was amazing. I love that book. It talks about um, what, like, basically how minds change, how beliefs work, and how it's possible to change how beliefs change and the best way to go about changing someone's mind. And then I read the book, uh, What's Our Problem from Tim Urban. And that was really good. Um, you know, talking about all these huge cultural changes and, you know, what's happening on college campuses and like council culture and the new political orthodoxy. And those two were kind of my, my reintroduction. And I just started diving in and watching a bunch of videos. And then, you know, at that point, I was still convinced by a friend that's like, oh, you know, turfs are, are evil, you know, or don't listen to this person because they're conservative. I, I, I wasn't ever super deep into that line of thinking, but there, there were certain things I would avoid. And I just started listening to stuff. I just, I just really opened up and I started listening to women who oppose um, men and women's faces and essentially confirmed what I was worried about, that most of the claims about how bad people are are really just hyperbole, and it's just fabricated. And I... So like those, th that and me struggling so hard with being able to be productive, I got to this point where I have to dig into my past. And that's when I re-examined what my dad did. I started opening up more to my partner and came to the conclusion my father caused my gender dysphoria. And I defined who I was around what he did to me. And I don't have to do that anymore. I've already not been identifying as female for quite a while. I don't want to lose my hair, but let's go back on testosterone. I mean, it is the chemical my body was designed to run with. And um, there are some regrets. One interesting thing that I'm speculating on, so I'm pretty sure that I have autogynephilia. And for anyone that doesn't know, that's the um, being sexually aroused by the thought of being a woman. And I suspect that my father had that as well. And that might have been why he was so insecure about his own manhood. And, what made you think he might have had that? Um, just mostly the way, so there's a few things. The way he would talk about, um, you know, telling everyone to be a man. Like, it wasn't just me. It was strangers. It was his own friends. He would just intimidate and, and just be a man to, like, everyone. They weren't you know, acting as tough as him. And so the insecurity of that mixed with, he was really weird. Um, he, he, so there was no explicit sexual abuse from my father. And there was an incredibly weird incident that happened one at one point. But he was really weird when it came to sex. Like he was just super open with talking about it. Like it was super normal. He would tell me the kinds of things that he would that he liked, and he was and when I was like twelve years old, you know. And he he gave me pornos when I was twelve, and he's like, "Make your dad proud. Here you go, you know." And and was it straight porn? Um, yeah. From what I remember, it was straight, or it was just weird. Um, like apparently there's a movie called Edward Penis Hands. Okay. And it's a parody of Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> and I was 12. So, yeah. um, and that was actually the same visit where I told, he's like, if you, because like, I would always go home early because he'd always make me, make me feel like crap. And he's like, if you go home early this time, I'm going to hold you down and I'm going to give you hickeys all over your neck. 
So when I send you back, you're going to have to explain to the person you're dating that, you know, that you didn't cheat on them. Good luck. And so when I, I, t I forgot about it and then I told him I wanted to go home and he's like, are you sure? And he's like, I'm like, yes. And then he literally tackled me down and he gave me like 20 hickeys on my neck and sent me home. And my mom was just like, what the hell? You know, that was the last time I visited him. And so, you know, I don't remember any anything super explicit, although we black out things. Um, I don't know. Um, but he was definitely really weird. And so I think I think that maybe you know, like like having sexual feelings that aren't normal might have prompted him to just be more open about stuff. I don't, I don't even know if that necessarily makes sense, but that's kind of just like a hunch. But mm -hmm. yeah, so because I have those feelings and I recognize that those feelings was also part of this fog of confusion for um, wanting to transition, that helps with some of the regret. I wish I didn't cut into my body. You know, I would rather have healthy parts. And, you know, I would like to make love to my partner as I guess nature intended. But um, after everything I've been through, like not having junk is in some weird way a small price to pay for. I'm here. I'm I'm here now, and now I know what I know, and I'm just happy to be alive. And going back to when you were around 13, 14, and you felt so much discomfort in your body that, you know, like you said, you didn't even want to touch yourself down there. Do you still experience those sensations? Do you still experience that discomfort in your body? No, I don't experience that anymore. Um, and it's hard to say that if I still, if I didn't have bottom surgery and I still had, you know, my natural genitalia, would I still feel dangerous for you? I'm not sure. Knowing what I know now, I don't think I would. And now that I, you know, I've had had bottom surgery and it's actually been my 10 year anniversary this year. So I've, I've been with it for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm not experiencing gender dysphoria with it. Um, as in, oh, I wish I had a penis again. Um, but I, I, I can still tell it's not quite settled. I might come to regret this more as time goes on. Um, I'm hoping that, um, that doesn't happen and I'll be okay with, you know, who I've settled as <laughs> since there's no going back. Mm-hmm. And have you, I'm hoping not, but have you experienced any pain or phantom limb sensations I've heard about some people experiencing after the penile inversion? Um, do you experience anything like that? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, off and on, more so at the first few years, but I, I have had like random sensations from what felt like my left testicle and being like, Where's that coming from? Because I know it's not there anymore. <laughs> so there have been some um, phantom limb type sensations. Getting wet is not a thing. It is a mucous membrane, so it is producing mucus, but it has nothing to do with uh, being, being aroused. Um, the same mechanisms that would make a penis hard for an erection, I can still feel that sensation happening. Um, even if, if nothing like, you know, like things get tense, but nothing visually, you know, changes and, um, also just with like the hormones in general, it kind of crushes your orgasms. Obviously you're not, you're not going to produce much sperm if before surgery and then after you're definitely not going to produce any. But the surgery and the estrogen just like kills the libido. You can still orgasm, but it's you know it's just it's such a less important part of your life. And since being on testosterone again, I have felt my sex drive come back online, and I have felt um, physical changes to how my body, what my body does during an orgasm. There's just like it's I can feel like it's almost like sexual breath has been breathed 
you know, back into my body in some weird way. And have you had any complications just in general from the surgery or from the hormones? Um, luckily not. I have not had any major complications. And um, I probably should have. I mean, right? Like, all the, all the stuff I've been through, I mean, something could still go wrong, right? In 10 years, who knows? Like, the way it's connected, I could just get necrosis and then have to get it removed part of the inside you know like um maybe when i you know if i dilate and become sexually active again you know like maybe i could damage myself just to trying to do normal human activities um, yeah. is it um so do you so you don't currently dilate and do you have any issues with that um yeah i actually wanted to to get into that so after about a year, year and a half of this, from from the, getting the surgery, I kind of stopped dilating, right? Depressed, no hormones, just like, eh, I don't want to do it. It's, you know, it's supposed to be like an everyday thing. Um, and I, I stopped and luckily no complications. Um, there's, it's really weird. Like part of the anatomy, in, in addition to that, the inflexible seam just on the inside where the mucous membrane hits the skin the mucous membrane extends for at least six inches and there's actually a muscle in the way and they had to cut into the muscle and to extend part of the um the colon the mucous membrane through and so that that's the part that feels like it's the most important to dilate Otherwise, it can kind of serve as like a kind of almost like, like a like a cork, and you can get some of the mucus that builds up on the inside. And then when that breaks, there's like more of a discharge. Um, and you know, it can be gross. Like you know, like this isn't some glorious savior, you know, solve your problems kind of surgery. Like there's weird aspects to it. So my last question is. Do you have any advice for other people who've go who've gone through similar things? People who have, you know, how how do we deal with intense discomfort with our bodies without transitioning? Yeah, so that's a really tough position, and I don't know what someone could have said or done for me to help me in that moment. But one of like the, the defining things about being human is that you are so absolutely sure that you are right until you to figure until you figure out that you're wrong and don't trust your feelings you know there there's an objective reality and you know future you is you and waiting in a in a sense whatever you do now is going to affect who you become and sometimes there are just kinds of changes that you cannot take back. And I know that it's hard to know for sure who you are beforehand, but like odds are whatever you're feeling, it might be coming from somewhere else. And it might be coming from deep. And if you're really set on transitioning, I highly recommend really figuring out everything else first because gender dysphoria is colored by trauma and experience and you have to be really sure that you know so thank you yeah hopefully that was good thank you so much Ari, and i think we'll leave it at that i really appreciate you coming on awesome yeah thank you so much for your time i really enjoyed um sharing my story and i appreciate all your questions